in May 2012, Rebecca realized that it was very difficult for the average person to find information about evidence-based maternity care. Realizing that she had the research and writing skills to meet this need, Rebecca coined the term evidence-based birth and founded www.evidencebasedbirth.com. Their mission is to promote evidence-based practice during childbirth by providing research evidence directly to women and families. Um, this has led to new opportunities for Rebecca. She is now on the executive board of directors of improvingbirth.org, a nonprofit, and she's given many presentations to nursing students, medical residents, college students, and nurse midwives. Um, she will be a presenter at the upcoming American College of Nurse Mid Midwives annual conference at the end of this month. Um, she's also wife to Dan and mom to two young children. Before um, uh, Rebecca starts her presentation, let's make sure that everybody is um, up to speed with the technology of the presentation. Um, we would like to thank the University College of Lillebach, Denmark, and the Association of Radical Midwives for their sponsorship. Um, if, uh, to set up your audio, if you haven't done so already, go to the um, Meeting tab, click on the drop-down menu, and work your way through the audio setup wizard. Um, as people, it looks like people are already pretty familiar with the chat window, but you can use that to um, ask questions during the presentation and also to um, talk with other participants at the conference. If you wish to talk privately to somebody, please use the private chat, and this demonstrates how you can do that under the participants um, drop-down menu on the left side of your screen. Okay, at the top of the screen on your left, if you want to ask a question or make a comment, um, raise your hand there, and I will um, give you the microphone. Okay. And once, the, once I've given you the microphone, you'll see the symbol of a mic next to your name in the attendees box. Click on the mic symbol at the top, allow access to the flash player, and you know you can speak because the microphone will turn from white to green with a star. If they can't hear you, click on the microphone symbol, adjust your volume. When you finish talking, disconnect your microphone so that there's not feedback for the other participants. Okay, and now it's time to turn on record. Okay. It's like it's already recording. Okay, Rebecca, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to speak with you all today, and happy International Midwives Day. Um, for me, I'm speaking from Lexington, Kentucky. It's a big day here because we just celebrated the Kentucky Derby and got finished with our derby party. And now I get to talk with all of you about using social media to get uh, birth evidence to mothers. So let me start off by telling you all a little bit about how I became interested in evidence-based maternity care. Here's a photo of me about four and a half years ago when I was 39 weeks pregnant with my first child, a girl. I was a doctoral student at the time. I had a really wonderful, healthy pregnancy, and I was in great physical condition. I didn't do a whole lot of educational preparation for my birth, other than taking the hospital birthing class. Because being a nurse, I anticipated that the hospital nurses would know how to best take care of me. However, I was a cardiac nurse, and so I wasn't familiar with labor and delivery protocol. When my water broke and I went into labor spontaneously at 39 and a half weeks, we went to the hospital. And I was surprised when I found myself being treated as if I was very acutely ill, as if I was one of my own heart patients on the cardiac care unit. I was not allowed to eat or drink, not allowed to get out of bed, not even to use the restroom, hooked up to many different monitors, which were very uncomfortable, and pressured into many interventions that were not medically necessary. Even though I didn't know that much at the time about the evidence uh, for what's best uh, during childbirth, Something about this whole experience just struck me intuitively as wrong. I was healthy, my baby was healthy, and everything was going beautifully. So why was I treated like I was sick? It just didn't make sense. 
after I got home from the hospital, I began to think about the care that myself and my daughter had received during birth and the postpartum period. I asked myself, was my care evidence-based? I was teaching nursing students at the time. I was immersed in research. And one of the big things is we're constantly pounding into our students' head is you have to use evidence-based practice. We have to provide evidence-based care. Well, here's a photo of my healthy daughter when she was separated from me for three hours immediately after birth for observation. Was delaying breastfeeding so that my daughter could be observed and bathed? Was this based on evidence? Being a researcher, I had access to the research evidence, so I looked it up. Imagine my surprise when I found that almost every aspect of the care that I had received, that this care has been shown by high quality research evidence to be harmful to healthy women and healthy babies when used routinely without medical indication. So here's a chart um, that illustrates the routine care that's received by most childbearing women in the US where I am based. Um, and this is describing what first time mothers experience. For example, 42% of first-time mothers in the U.S. have their labor artificially induced with medications, a practice that doubles their risk of C-section. One-third of these inductions are carried out without any medical indication. About half of women in the U.S. have their labor artificially set up with drugs, a practice that has not been shown to be helpful by the evidence and may have harmful adverse effects. Other routine interventions, such as artificial breaking of the waters, continuous monitoring, IV fluids, nothing by mouth, restriction to bed, and being told to lay on your back while pushing are used with almost all women in the U.S. Even though research evidence shows that these practices, when used routinely, are not necessary and can be even harmful. The evidence against most of these routine interventions is at the meta-analysis level, which is the highest level of research evidence, with the exception um, of the evidence for IV fluids and the evidence against the use of IV fluids during birth, the routine use of IV fluids without indication, um, is at the randomized control trial level. So I started to think, after um, my birth, what, um, how can we shorten this evidence-based practice gap? So we know that it takes up to 20 years for research evidence to make its way into practice. I really felt like maternity care was in need of an innovative way to solve this problem. So what, how could we solve this problem? At the time I was thinking about this, I was reading a leadership book. It's called Flash Foresight. And um, this book talks about um, using innovative, innovative ways to solve seemingly unsolvable problems. And one of the ways you can solve unsolvable problems is to take your biggest problem and skip it. So what's our biggest problem? It's that entire systems of care, entire hospital systems, have difficulty implementing evidence-based practice for a variety of reasons. So I propose that we skip that problem. We, we take the, the hospital system, we skip it, and we take the concept of evidence-based practice directly to the end users of the healthcare, the patients, the clients, the consumers, the women. So what I decided to do was give the research evidence directly to the consumers. On a whim, I googled evidence-based care during labor and delivery, and I found that nobody else was blogging about this topic. So I started a blog. I registered the domain name evidencebasedbirth.com, and I began posting summaries about the research evidence on different maternity care topics. I coined the term evidence-based birth, which up until that point had not been used anywhere on the internet. The term to me just very briefly but eloquently summarizes that this is evidence-based information for consumers so that they can become engaged in advocating for evidence-based care during birth. I felt that if women latch on to this concept of evidence-based care and women and families begin to stand up and demand evidence-based care and state that they will go somewhere else for their care if you don't give it to me here, that they will vote with their feet and their wallets then systems of care will have to change. It won't be a matter of not wanting to or not being able to. Hospitals won't be able to survive without the change. So I use social media um, to, to fulfill this, um, 
this, this goal I had of getting evidence to the consumer. The term social media means activities among people gathered online who share information. Um, in this way, you use conversational media. It makes it easy to create and share content in the form of words, pictures, videos, and audio. There are different categories that can be considered social media. For example, a blog, such as mine, is a type of primary social media. Um, and then another type of primary social media would be like a Facebook group or a Facebook page or a Twitter account. Secondary social media has to do more with uh, the comments that are left on Facebook pages and that are not directly um, from the consumer. So like when people leave comments on my blog post, I didn't initiate that, but somebody else did this. So that's a secondary social media. So what is an e-patient? I'm trying to see my notes here. Um, an e-patient is a catchy way of referring to the engaged patient. So the internet in general, and social networking tools in particular, has fueled a new era of patient engagement. So we can consider this the e-patient, in which access and innovation are transforming patients from passengers of their health care to the drivers of the health care they receive. In a paper in the Journal of Perinatal Education about the use of social media to promote VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean, Amy Romano, a nurse midwife, wrote, that this massive, complex, unplanned, unprecedented, and spontaneous medical empowerment of our lay citizens may turn out to be the most important medical transformation of our lifetime. So why use social media? I think that um, there's a variety of reasons that midwives could, why they may use social media. Um, Primarily, I think, to dialogue with clients, to meet your women where they are. Um, it also could be to expand the client base and to connect with other birth professionals. One great example of that is there is a Facebook group called Birth Professionals. I believe you can search for it in Facebook. I think it consists mainly, mainly of midwives, um, Birth, uh, childbirth educators and doulas, and they can connect with each other, share information, talk about different issues together. For me, I really wanted to use social media to put evidence-based information out on the internet. There's a saying that content is king, and if you don't aren't putting content out on the internet, somebody else is. So if you don't like what's out there that your clients are reading, then you need to put something out there for them to read instead. You don't necessarily have to generate the content yourself. You can use social media to find and share evidence-based information at the click of a button. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes to talk about how I use social media to promote evidence-based birth in the hopes that perhaps you can use um, some of what I've done um, and put it into practice. So a blog, as I said earlier, is the form of primary social media, and that is primarily how I fulfill my mission to get birth evidence out to mothers. But I've integrated my blog with several different types of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. And I'm also going to talk about how I use blog comments, which remember blog comments are also a type of social media. So I did this all myself. I kind of learned it as I went. I read books about it. I Googled it. I asked other people to help me. But there are um, small businesses out there that can actually help you integrate your birth business um, with these different social media outlets. And if you know, I can give that information if anybody else, anybody wants the names of those organizations. So one of the first things I did, and it might sound silly, but I went to the library and I checked out this book called Mom Blogging for Dummies. And it seems silly, but I learned a ton from reading this book. And I was able to avoid a lot of the pitfalls by listening to their advice and heeding their warnings. One of the first things that I learned is that WordPress is one of the best hosts out there for blogs. You could also use Blogger. It's called blogspot.com. 
which is run by Google, but the book said, and I agreed, that WordPress looks more professional, so people take it more seriously. The next thing I did is I had to figure out if I wanted to use WordPress.org or .com. Now, I found this to be very confusing, and I still get confused about this. Because normally you think of .org as being a nonprofit, right? So that would be free. But it's actually the opposite. Um, WordPress.com is free. You have to pay a fee to use WordPress.org. So I started off using the free service at WordPress.com. But there's limitations. There's no advertising. So if you want to put ads on your blog, you can't do that. And there's limited freedom to do stuff to your blog with the layout. Um, so eventually I decided to switch to WordPress.org. So with WordPress.org, you have to find a computer company who will host your website for you. But once you get it up, you have total freedom to do whatever you want to customize your site. And WordPress makes it really easy to um, customize how your website looks. I decided right away that I wanted to buy my own domain name. That means my own website name. It cost $10 a year, but I felt that it was worth it so that I could be evidencebasedbirth.com. Otherwise, my website address would have been evidencebasedbirth.wordpress.com, which I thought was too cumbersome. But another um, piece of advice that I got from Mom Blogging for Dummies was to purchase a professional-looking theme or a premium theme. The more professional-looking your blog, the more people will take it seriously. I purchased a theme from Theme Forest called Sterling. And most themes sell for around $50, which is a one-time fee. Finally, I had to develop a purpose for my blog from the very beginning. This helped me keep focus. A lot of people start blogging and then nothing becomes of it. But on the other hand, what if your blog becomes really successful and starts generating a lot of traffic? What will you do with your success? What's the purpose of it all? I decided early on that the purpose of my blog was not to make money off of advertising. It was simply to disseminate information about evidence-based birth. My mission was to promote evidence-based birth practices worldwide. Keeping that mission always in mind helped me focus the direction of my blog and not get pulled into a hundred different directions. So here's just an example of what a regular theme looks like. So this is from my original when I was using um, the free WordPress.com. And this was a free theme. And it was very nice, but I felt like I wanted more, something more. So I switched to this, which is um, a premium theme that I paid for. So the next thing that I would recommend doing, if you want to use social media, you can use your own Facebook profile. But I think when you're um, working as a midwife or some other kind of birth professional, it may be best to create a Facebook page. That way you can kind of keep your personal, private life separate from your work life. And so that's what I did. A couple months into blogging, I started realizing that this was turning into something bigger than I thought it was going to be. So I created a Facebook page, which was really easy to do. Anybody can do it. It's totally free. Once you hit a certain number of likes, I can't remember how many it is exactly. It might be 50. You'll get detailed statistics on who visits your page and how many uh, friends of fans you have, how many people are talking about your page, how viral your posts are, how many people you reach each week with your page. So. A couple things I would recommend is to get a good profile pic and also to get a good um, the, the picture of the ocean that I have here. Um, you can create those. There's a lot of websites up there where you can Google how to make um, a timeline photo is what it's called, a timeline photo. Because if you have a really beautiful timeline photo, I think people are more likely to visit your page and like it. A couple of ways I use Facebook to build the community. Um, I let readers direct the topics of my blog. For example, when I couldn't decide between two blog topics, I posed a question on Facebook. Would you rather have an article on GBS, Group B Strep, 
or hypnosis. Within hours, I had 200 responses from readers overwhelmingly saying that they wanted an article on group B-strep. And I would say that if you start a Facebook page or if you have one, that's a really great way to get your readers engaged is to ask questions. For some reason, people love answering questions. So while I was working on the Group B Strep article over the next month, I kept my community updated with trivia questions about Group B Strep and tidbits that I was finding in my research. Then when I finally published the article, I alerted my readers by posting on Facebook that the article was available. And it, they began sharing it like crazy. Throughout this whole process, readers posed many interesting questions and made comments that helped me think more about the controversies with Group B Strep so that I could make sure to include those topics in my article. Even after my blog article was published, reader comments on the blog and on Facebook, remember this is a form of secondary social media, helped me realize what changes I might need to make to future editions of the article. So that gets us to comments on both your blog and on Facebook, but particularly on your blog, because you've got to remember that if you have a blog, it's out there on the internet, it's permanent, and everybody can see it. One of the great things about blog comments is that people love reading them. Also, when readers comment, they can provide personal stories that um, bring the research evidence to life. They can say, this is how I use this research evidence, or um, this was the decision I made with this research evidence. They can also raise issues that were not covered in the article itself. For example, when I wrote the Group B Strep article, I made the mistake of not delving into the research about how antibiotics may affect the gut flora. And my readers quickly jumped all over that and pointed it out. Um, and so I'm making, I have plans to include that in the future edition of the article. However, moderating blog comments can be a headache. And especially if you post on anything controversial, which there are a lot of controversial topics in the birth world, you're going to need a comment policy. For me, I really um, feel that respect is one of my core values. And so I, I have that very clearly outlined in my comments policy that comments must remain respectful and that personal attacks will not be tolerated, and that readers who leave personal attacks will be banned from commenting in the future. I also ask, because of the focus of my blog, that comments remain centered on the evidence, that people don't make, state, make huge sweeping claims or state opinions as facts without having any evidence to back it up. Um, but that's specific to my blog. So if you want an example of a comment policy, you can feel free to go to my main web page and under the About column, you'll see my comments policy. And you can feel free to use that um, or copy it in any way for your own blog. Next, I added Twitter to my arsenal of social media. So I kind of started blogging. And then a few months later, I started using Facebook. And then a few months later, I added Twitter. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Twitter, you have 140 characters to um, make your message known. And that's called a tweet. And there are more than 200 million tweets sent out per day. And you only see the, one, the tweets from people that you follow. So there's people that follow evidence-based birth on Twitter. And they can see what I tweet. Interestingly enough, two-thirds of Twitter users are between the ages of 18 and 34, and more than half of them are female. So if you want to use Twitter, it's pretty easy. You just create an account. You have to pick a name. My name is at birth evidence, because evidence-based birth was too long. And you just start tweeting. Um, if you're really lazy, as I was in the very beginning, you can make your Facebook page automatically post your Twitter account so that the two are linked. So you don't even have to do any work with Twitter. Once you set it up, it just tweets out what you put on Facebook. And so I kind of showed you here um, on the right-hand side, there's a screenshot. And you can see a highlighted resources. So under your Facebook page, you would go to resources. And then at the bottom on the right-hand side, it says link your page to Twitter. Someone says, hey, that's not lazy. It's efficient. And that's probably true. <laughs> I guess I was being efficient, not lazy. 
Um, the other thing that I started using was Pinterest. And I find Pinterest um, really fascinating. I think um, it's becoming interesting because one in five US women is using Pinterest. They have 11 million users per month, and almost all of them are female. So usually Pinterest is used where women kind of almost like a, a board where they wallpaper their uh, wall with all their different craft ideas and fashion outfits and recipes. But a lot of women are starting to use Pinterest to pin things like what they want at their birth or how they want to take care of their baby after the baby is born. So to use Pinterest, it's really easy. You create an account. Um, it takes a while to get accepted. If you want to get an account faster, you can ask one of your friends who has an account to invite you, and then you'll automatically be invited. Once you get your account, you set up something called boards. And it's just kind of like a folder where you collect the different things that you want in there. Um, so the different things that are in your boards are called pins. And so you find different articles or images that you like online, and you can pin them. And just like Facebook, people can share or like your pins. And I actually get an interesting number of traffic to my website from people who um, link to my website from Pinterest. So as a result of um, two things, first I think the topic that I was blogging on, the fact that I was fulfilling a niche that wasn't there, oops, looks like my um, graph didn't come up here on my slide. So it's missing. But I will, um, so I was showing where my traffic comes from. Sorry, let's go back. The growing audience. So my audience has grown 2,400% since a year ago. I started blogging exactly one year ago. And in my first month, I had 2,000 visitors to my website. And in this past month of April, I had 56,000. So it's been steadily growing every month, partly, I think, because of um, the content and partly because of uh, social media. So where does my traffic come from? It looks like this is not showing my pie chart. Um, but over an eight-month period, so from September to April, Google Analytics showed that about half of my traffic, or 80,000 visits, came from referrals from social media, meaning that people are linking to my website on social media, blogs, Facebook, Twitter, baby center forums, LinkedIn, and Pinterest. Of those 80,000 visits from social media, 65,000 came from Facebook, 4,000 from message boards on babycenter.com, 3,000 from other blogs, and 1,000 from LinkedIn. Also, interestingly enough, about half of my website traffic comes from mobile devices. So um, I then the, um, keep taking away my notes. So. I think it's interesting that social media is driving half of the website uh, traffic to my website. About a quarter of my traffic comes from Google searches and a quarter from direct traffic, meaning that people type in my web address directly into their computers or their phones. So um, again, it looks like none of my graphics are showing up. But the top evidence-based art birth articles um, so far have been ones that I've written on erythromycin eye ointment for newborns, um, which I think it is getting uh, more Google hits than anything else. A lot of women are Googling why, why do they put erythromycin eye ointment on newborns, because that's something that they do here in the US and in Canada. Um, evidence for doulas, evidence for um, testing for group B strep, evidence for in induction for gestational diabetes, and the evidence for skin to skin after a C-section. Every time I write an article, I follow a specific method, which includes reviewing the highest level research evidence available and having each article peer reviewed by multiple experts in the field. So do women want access to evidence-based information? I think the short answer is yes. And I can tell that just from the traffic to my website. But being a researcher, I kind of wanted to delve more into this topic. So several of my nursing students and I got IRB approval to do an internet-based 
survey study. Um, so this is some preliminary data from the study. Um, with 1,481 participants, most of them were female, and most of them were college educated. 97% said that they had read evidence-based maternity information online. 86% said that it's very important that the medical information that they receive about maternity care is evidence-based. And 85% are very interested in reading evidence-based maternity care articles. So how do women find evidence-based birth information online? Again, it looks like my graphics aren't showing up. But um, from the survey, 30, about 45% found their information about maternity care through Facebook and about 34% through Google. So I would encourage you all as midwives to Google various hot topics and see what comes up at the very top because it's likely that that's what your patients are reading. It's very likely that your clients, um, that women, are looking for evidence-based information through Google searches and through Facebook links. Um, this also doesn't show my pie graphs, but um, so as healthcare professionals, many of you may be concerned about whether or not your clients can discern what is evidence-based quality information and what is junk, because we all know that there's a lot of worthless information out there on the internet. Interestingly enough, when we asked women how confident they were in their ability to tell whether an article is evidence-based, 93% of women said um, that, sorry, 84% said that they were confident in their um, ability to tell whether something was evidence-based. Regardless of their confidence, 93% of women said that they were planning to use the information from the most recent evidence-based article that they read. So out of all of the women who took the survey, we specifically looked at who the pregnant women were talking with this information about. And I think you all will find this interesting as midwives. Only 37% of women said that they were very likely to share this information that they had read with their doctors, while 61% so that they would share this information with midwives. And I think that this is supported in the research literature um, on one other study where they showed that pregnant women were more likely to talk with their midwives about information that they had found on maternity care. Only 24% were very likely to talk with their nurses about it, whereas the majority of women were very likely to talk with their doulas, their partners, and their friends about what they were reading about maternity care. So evidence-based birth is by no means just a US phenomenon. All around the world, women are seeking out evidence-based information about labor and delivery. This map shows um, uh, from a seven-month period the international visitors to evidence-based birth. So I think that women around the world are becoming um, educated about the concept of evidence-based practice. They're latching onto it. And they want to know what has been proven to work best at birth. I wanted to just talk briefly about improvingbirth.org um, so that you can kind of see another way that we're using social media. Um, last, last fall, I was invited to join the board of improvingbirth.org. And their mission is to bring evidence-based care and humanity or respect to childbirth. And so this is an organization run by moms for moms. It's a mom-oriented organization. And I wanted to use them as an example of how social media can be used to mobilize moms. Uh, um, about a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago, a doula wanted to organize a national rally where women all over the United States would hold up signs in front of hospitals requesting uh, better maternity care. And people told her it can't be done. Everyone she talked to said, there's no way you can do that. But she did. She was able to do it. And she tells everyone she talks to that it was all due to social media. She used social media, which is free, to network with people all around the country. And on Labor Day in the US in September 2012, there were 120 10 rally locations in 46 states with nearly 10,000 attendees, moms, dads, kids, 
midwives, nurses, and doctors. Um, using social media, in that one month of September, they reached one million people with their message about evidence-based maternity care and the need for respect. And they have big plans for 2013. Um, we're currently on track to double the number of rally sites in the U.S. Um, and we um, anticipate a huge increase in the number of people we'll be able to reach through social media. So here's just some um, pictures that some of the readers sent me who were at rallies. This is a doctor and a midwife in Alaska who said, a doctor and a midwife for evidence-based birth. And I love that picture. I'm so happy when she sent that to me. And here's some more pictures of people holding up signs. I just think it's great that I started blogging in May of 2012. And in September 2012, women all around the United States were holding up signs on street corners saying evidence-based birth. So in conclusion, what are the implications for midwives? How does this impact you as a provider? Well, I think it's important for you to understand that many pregnant mothers want to be deeply engaged in their plan of care, and that women are looking for evidence-based information online, but they're not necessarily talking about this information with their providers, although the majority of women who have midwives say that they're talking to their midwives about what they're reading, a substantial portion are still not. So it may be important for care providers to ask women what they've been looking for answers to online, or if there's anything that they've been reading online about pregnancy and birth that they'd like to discuss. And finally, I think that midwives can use social media to find and share and get evidence-based information out to women of childbearing age. It's easy, quick, and best of all, it's free to disseminate information using social media. So now do you have any questions? I didn't get to a chance to read all of the comments because it was too distracting while I was talking. So Catherine, do you want to moderate comments? Or well, I, there's do you want to? who had her hand raised. So is Joni still in the room, and does she have a question or a comment? I don't see a response. So I'm just going to go over here and see, does anybody want to type in a comment? or? Um, it looks like a lot of people are really impressed with your presentation and your um, your website and blog. Yeah, feel free to ask questions either by typing them in. I can look at them now. I wasn't able to look at them while I was talking. Mm -hmm. I guess, how do you define evidence? Um, oh, that's I, nice. That, which is a good, a good question. I def personally define it as um, research evidence, although um, if you're familiar with the concept of evidence-based practice, it includes, um, evidence can include clinical expert opinion, although that is a, a lower, um, considered a lower level of evidence because it's higher um, risk of bias. But, um, so I mostly write about the research evidence, unless there isn't any research evidence, but there are almost always at least some. Other than the obvious goal of improving attorney care, is there another motivation to do this work? Can you make money blogging? Is it good for an academic career? And yes, you can feel free to share my sites with your patients. I'd love it if you shared it with them. Um, evidence is mostly hospital-based. I do focus my blog mostly on in-hospital birth, but simply that's because we're 99% of women in my country give birth, and I feel that's where I can make the biggest difference. I have written several articles about home birth and uh, birth center birth. But um, can you make money blogging? It's really difficult. I would, if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to check out books from your public library about blogging, um, as I did. You would have to have an incredible amount of traffic to your website to make any decent amount of money off of advertising. Um, so. Um, Unless you hit it really big, advertising isn't going to make you money. Now, if 
you you gotta th you gotta first think about what is the point of your blog. Like, do you want to make a career out of it, or do you want your blog to get you exposure so that maybe you get a job offer somewhere? Um, I will say that blogging has opened up opportunities for me, um, consulting opportunities, and people have paid me to write professional blog articles, and I didn't even think that that would ever come up. Um, haven't you guys ever heard of vbacfacts.com? Um, vbacfacts.com. I think Jen Camel of vbacfacts.com is a great example of someone who has been able to not only provide a resource for women who want a VBAC, but to um, also have a small business through it. And she teaches online webinars, and she charges um, $85 a person for her um, their live classes, a five-hour class online. And she has a substantial number of women take her class. So there's other ways to make money other than advertising. But at this point, I have a full-time job, and so it's not really the point you know, I don't really want to make money off of this. At this, at this time in my life, it's for me just a service that I want to provide. Um, so is it good for your academic career? That's an interesting question. I've actually tried to keep um, my academic career completely separate from my blog, which has been hard. Well, one of the reasons I don't say the name of my university anywhere on my blog website is because if I do, then I have to run everything I write past my university. Um, so it would completely take away my freedom. And also, it would potentially compromise my intellectual copyright. Right now, I own the copyright to all the content that I create. And if it were affiliated with my university, then they could potentially claim that they own my blog. So it's kind of a fine line I've been having to walk. How do you build a following on Facebook and Twitter? Um, for me, it just kind of happened virally. So I don't really know um, how to build it. I guess I could say I just built the page and people came. I do try to keep a respectful tone as the administrator and not allow comments that are mean or personal attacks. Um, I also try to dialogue with the community. And I share, whenever I post articles, they get shared. I've noticed that whenever I post an article, uh, a new article, I will automatically get several hundred new followers. So you know, having that new content. Another thing, if you want to post, if you want to gather a following, what I've noticed what improvingbirth.org has been doing is that they've been creating infographics, which are a small photo um, with a saying on it that may be really provocative or inspiring. And people share that photo, and then they'll come like your page. Do I have large offices in, in the medical field? Cora, did you have a um, question? I've enabled your microphone if you want to speak. Are still um, available in the room? Um, I so Beth Ann asked, is there a large opposition in the medical field to my blog post? And nobody has come out to get me um, yet, but who knows? Um, I I I have not been targeted. Well I, I, well, I will say I have been targeted, targeted by some uh, certain bloggers, um, but not by any respected healthcare professionals. Um, no. I haven't had any opposition yet, although we'll see what happens. Often the opposition is directed to the qualifications of the blogger. I do feel really fortunate that um, I'm able to say that I have my PhD and that I'm a nurse, an advanced practice nurse. I do not have a clinical background in obstetrics. But in some ways, I feel like that is um, a strength because I'm able to look at all of the research evidence and kind of take a step back 
and I don't have any built-in biases because I was never trained or um, indoctrinated into one certain way of practicing. So I feel like I'm able to really look at things with an unbiased point of view. Um, has Dr. Amy been on my site? She has actually written blog, a couple of blog articles um, saying that evidence-based birth suffers from a sore lack of evidence. But the thing is, is I actually have never, I never go to her website and read her articles or read anything bad that she says about me because it's not worth my time. Yeah, someone says you can't win with her. And, you know, I just feel like I'm not even on the same field, playing field as her. Like, and I, this may sound snotty, but I just say I think, you know, she's so far beneath all of us with um, her tactics. And, you know, so this is a, a very well-known blogger who is very inflammatory, um, but she, she um, can say such horrible things about people that, to me, someone who's so disrespectful just isn't even worth engaging with or, or even talking about. I shouldn't even be talking about her. <laughs> She's not worth our time. Um, do you believe that women will believe anything you post? Um, well, I do worry. I have a disclaimer on my website that, you know, this is not medical advice. All I'm doing is summarizing the research evidence. And I think it's critical and imperative that women talk about what they read with their care providers um, because, you know, the care providers are the ones with, with also the clinical expertise, and they can help you figure out whether or not that evidence even applies to your situation. Um, because one of the core components of evidence-based practice is knowing, is tailoring that care to the individual and knowing whether or not evidence applies to an individual. And you need that care provider. So um, I always try and emphasize that on my website. Um, any ideas, comments about how organizations can overcome the 20-year gap in evidence to practice? Um, you know, I think it's, it's going to take consumer and I hate to, some, I know some people don't like the word consumer, but I feel like the end user of healthcare, whoever that is, um, needs to use their power. No single care provider um, or person can make this change. And that's why I really like being involved with improvingbirth.org because it's kind of mobilizing the end users of healthcare, the moms, um, so that because when they all put their voices together as one, it's a much stronger voice. And only then, I think, when there's demand for the change, will you see the change happen. Um, has it's digital been media been a conversation, hasn't it? Um, and there, you know, there's certainly a lot of more questions, like you know, the um, gap that, as Dallas Knight is saying, the gap between applying research to practice. But I think that will have to be saved for another time. We really thank you, Rebecca. That was a great um, either introduction or furthering of the conversation on how to um, dialogue with moms and families on evidence-based birth, and um, please continue your work. Thank you, and I just want to say thank you, everyone, for listening, and please feel free to email me or contact me through Facebook. Okay. Thanks again, everybody, for participating.